The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message by Pastor Ivan Blake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. The wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh my life, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, send your Holy Spirit to teach us now how, how we, your sheep, can follow our shepherd. Amen. Her name is Christine. Christine is a mother of, yeah, she has two kids, and the third one is on the way. And she would have a conversation with her eldest, whose name is Tim. He's four and a half years old, and he was curious. What's going to happen to you, Mom? And she explains to him. She says, Tim, you're baby number one. Your sister is baby number two. This is baby number three. 
And this is it. There is no more coming. And with that, Tim gets really sad. Really sad. And mom says to him, What's the matter? Oh, is that all you're going to have? Well, how many do you want? Three is a lot. And Tim is really, really sad. There's almost tears in his eyes. And he says, I want five more. You mean after this one, two more? No. After this one, five more. And mom gets to laugh, and she says to him, but where will we put them? Well, that's when Tim perks up. He's a problem solver. He's got the perfect plan. Mom, we need to get more beds. And two babies can sleep in the office. Two babies can sleep in the room with sister. And two babies can sleep in your room with dad. And that's it. And Tim has just figured out how he can make life at its best for himself. Lots of babies sleeping all over the house, and he's got his own room all to himself. <laughs> and Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have life more abundantly, more abundantly. What did Jesus mean by that? You take these two words, life is blank. What would you fill in the blank? Life is blank. Forrest Gump had an answer. He filled in that blank and he said, life is having a box of chocolates and you never know what you're going to get. Forrest Gump. Then there's Scott Peck. He's the author of a bestseller called The Road Less Traveled. And he starts out his book and says, life is difficult. So which of the two do you think had life more abundantly? The guy with a box of chocolates? or the guy with a difficult life. Surely when we think about the more abundant life, it's got to have lots of pleasure, lots of success, a bubbly personality, lots of friends, and every prayer answered the way I asked for it, abundant life. What does God say about abundant life? Let's find out. Turn to John chapter 10. Now, just imagine for a moment Jesus is with his disciples, and he's interested in their opinion, and he is going to say to them this. He says, guys, I want you to tell me something. I called you 12 together, and I want you to tell me what approach you think I should take with the Jewish people. What should I say to them? Who am I? Do you think the disciples would say, Jesus, we got it. You go to the Jewish people and you say, I am the good shepherd. Do you think that's what they will tell Jesus to do? Later today, you're with some friends and you're having a good time and those friends ask you, so what have you done today? Would you say to them, oh, I worshiped my shepherd today. Would you say that? Perhaps you would if you realized the shepherd Jesus has in mind, the kind of shepherd that's in his mind when he says, I'm the good shepherd. Perhaps you would if you knew what David had in mind as he said in, yeah, the very famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Can you try and imagine what Jesus had in mind 
Can you even imagine for a moment what, what David had in mind when he said, the Lord is my shepherd? At a minimum, at a minimum, they are saying that the shepherd is God. Because when it says, the Lord is my shepherd, you notice, and you'll find it in virtually all Bibles, in many places, that that name, Lord, is in four capitals, L-O-R-D. And that's very intentional because in the Hebrew, it's not L-O-R-D, obviously, but it is Y-H-W-H. And then later on, they added some vowels, and they made it to sound like Yahweh. It is the most supreme name of God. The Orthodox Jewish people, even today, will not even let that name pass their lips. They replace it with Adonai. And that word, that name, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, which we have as Lord in our Bible, is also the same name. It's used interchangeably in Exodus where God is talking to Moses, and he says to Moses, this is who I am. I am. That's who I am. I am who I am. Same as Yahweh, the most supreme name for God. That's who Jesus has in mind. That's who Moses has in mind when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. It's not like, I am. It's, I am. He's talking about his supreme name. He's talking about Yahweh. He is saying, Yahweh is the good shepherd, and it is me. That's what Jesus has in mind. So we cannot think about Jesus as the shepherd and not think about him as God, the divine God, the Yahweh, who takes on this role as shepherd. You know, if we put Jesus in the same class as the shepherd of the Middle East way back in the first century, and we see Jesus no more than that shepherd, a shepherd who, in fact, yeah, had no standing, just a common person whose testimony didn't count, who very few people had any respect for, no status at all. And if that is what we think Jesus is trying to get us to think about, we'll have very little desire to have Jesus, the shepherd, own us, be our shepherd, be the one to have authority over our lives. We wouldn't do that. But when we think of Jesus as he presents himself and adds now the shepherd role, everything changes. So I invite you for a moment then to reflect on Jesus. Jesus is, first of all, who? The Son of God. And when we say that, we mean that Jesus is the co-eternal Son of God with God the Father. He is co-equal. He is co-eternal. And when we say he's co-eternal with God the Father, we mean that he never had a beginning. Never. But he was incarnated. That means he lived before. Now he's incarnated, and that means that he took our humanity into union with his divinity. He wasn't less divine when he became human, and he's not 50% human, 50% divine, he is fully human, fully divine. The Jesus Christ, that's the one who says that he is the shepherd. So he is incarnated, and he is the direct and the full expression and revelation of God the Father. If you see Jesus, you see the Father. You never see a smile on Jesus' face without seeing a smile on the Father's face. He is the full expression of the Father. And this same Jesus is revealed in His Word. By the Holy Spirit, by God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead reveals Jesus. His job, His function is to put us in touch with Jesus, who now is our high priest in heaven. This Holy Spirit's task is to bring to our minds who this Jesus is. 
And today, may he present to you Jesus, the good shepherd. Not in just an ordinary way, not just in the way that you may be used to, but Jesus, the divine shepherd God. You know why that's important? It's terribly important because the lot of every sheep depended on what type of shepherd owned that sheep. Did you get that? The lot, the future, the, the well-being of every sheep depended on the type of shepherd that owned the sheep. So we have to make sure that the shepherd that we follow is indeed the true shepherd, is indeed the good shepherd. That's the same for us. You know, you can go to a counselor, and the counselor can actually comfort you in a storm, can help you work through that storm. But you need a shepherd who controls the storm. You can have a friend who can hold your hand at your bedside when you are dying, but you need a shepherd who has conquered death. That shepherd. Philosophers debate the meaning of life, but you need a shepherd who gives meaning to your life. I don't know about your dad, but there certainly was a stage when my dad knew everything in my eyes. And your dad may indeed be Superman who knows everything. But you and I need a shepherd. A shepherd who can shape a man from the dirt and then give him a hundred billion nerve cells. And each of those cells have as many as 10,000 connections with the other brain cells and then gather all that together and put it in a skull and call it a brain. And then give that person the mind of Christ. That shepherd. That shepherd. You think about the most gigantic galaxy, if you can, and at the same time, think about the most minute microbe and you realize that that galaxy and that microbe, they function in perfect harmony according to the laws which the great creator has put in place. And you thought your life was complex. It is our shepherd's role who can handle the complexities of the universe. Why can't he handle the complications of your life? That's the shepherd. That's the shepherd. And suddenly now, when you think about that shepherd, like David, you want to just proudly burst forth with this great declaration and say, do you know who my shepherd is? It's Jesus, the good shepherd. That's who my shepherd is. He is divine. He is God. He is Yahweh. He is everything. He is my shepherd. But the question is, what kind of abundant life will that shepherd give you? He might be the best shepherd in the universe, but what abundant life can he give you? Well, this shepherd is in an absolute class of his own, uncomparable, for a very different reason than what I have tried to mention to you so far. And that is, as you find in John 11 verse, 10 verse 11, it says there, the good shepherd, Jesus speaking, sacrifices his life or lays down his life. For who? For the sheep. Now, this is very unusual because the practice was in those ancient times that the sheep would be used as a blood sacrifice for the shepherd. But here it's reversed. It is that the shepherd becomes the blood sacrifice for who? For the sheep. 
Those listening to Jesus saying those words had never heard of anything like that before. That made no sense to them. How can that be? You see, we belong to him as his sheep, not just because he made us, but because he paid the incredible price with his own blood, with his own life. He shed blood in order for us to be his sheep forever. He purchased that. That's how special you are to him. He gave himself as the blood sacrifice for you, for me. The sacrifice. And now I have to ask the question again. That shepherd who gave himself as a blood sacrifice for me so I can have eternal life, what kind of abundant life is he going to give me? He is obviously capable of something enormous, something amazing. What is that abundant life? Well, Jesus also said, I am the door or the gate. And those who come in through me will be, what's the word? Be saved. Be saved. That's John 10 verse 9. And then it says, they will come and go freely and will find good pasture. Get the picture here. Jesus says, I'm the door, I'm the gate. There's a way in and there's a way out. But all of that depends on me. I'm the door. So there's a true story of a man called George Adam Smith, an Englishman, who traveled into the Middle East and went touring around there. And he came across a sheepfold with a shepherd, with a sheep. I mean, how fortunate is that? To get them all together right there by the fold. And he had a conversation with a shepherd. And uh, very simple. He said to him, so this is the place where the sheep come at night. <laughs> yeah, said the shepherd. That's exactly what they do. And in fact, when they are in here, in this fold, they are perfectly safe. George Adam Smith said, but where's the door? This is a very strong sheep fold. But the weakness is there's no gate, there's no door on it. There's just an open, gaping hole. And the shepherd pushes himself six inches taller, and he says to this Englishman, I am the door. What do you mean, you the door? When the light of the lamp goes out at night, and I know that all the sheep are inside, I don't go to my own home. This is my home. I lie in that open space. No sheep ever goes out unless it crosses over me. There is no wolf, there is no thief, there is nothing that can come in here unless it crosses my body. I am the door. Do you know what Jesus means when he says, I am the door? Here it is. It means that Jesus is the only, and I mean the only entrance into the fold, into heaven, into eternal life. He's the only entrance. Now, it doesn't say that the religion is the door. It doesn't say that all my good efforts and my good intentions and my 50 years of good record is the door. It says Jesus is the door, the only way in. That's justification. Big term for those who like big terms. That means you are right with God. You are saved in God's eyes. You're his child. You belong to him. You are safe for eternity because you entered his fold through the door who is Jesus. But it also means Jesus the door. He is the only access to the pasture, the abundant life. His good life, his best life for you, that's got to go through Jesus also. He's the shepherd that leads you there. You don't have an abundant life if it is not following the shepherd. He is the abundant life. 
I am the door. That is sanctification. Access to all we need, the pasture, the feeding, the growing, the developing, the discipline, the changing, the becoming like Him. All that comes through Jesus. He never stands at one end and lets His sheep take care of growing themselves and looking after themselves and taking care of their wounds. He is intimately involved. In fact, the shepherd means everything to those sheep. Everything. Everything. I am the door. What kind of abundant life can you expect from such a shepherd? Let's read it. 10 verse 10. It's got to be a good life. It's got to be a smiling sheep. Or have you always thought sheep are grousy? Are Christian sheep more grousy than glad? Or can Christian sheep be glad while everything else around them is grousy? Let's look at it. John 10 verse 10. Read it with me, everybody please. My purpose is to give the sheep a rich and satisfying life, life to the full, life more abundantly. <laughs> Is this the life that Jesus will come and give us once he comes in the clouds of heaven? And we won't enjoy this life until he comes, but then we'll enjoy it for eternity in heaven and on the new earth. Is that the abundant life? Well, it is, but it's not the only thing it is. The question is, can that abundant life, that full life, that satisfying life, can it be life on this earth right now with all its trouble, with all its difficulty, with all its sorrow? A favorite statement I found this week, two of them actually, share them with you. Life needs not be easy to be full. You don't seem moved by that. I was. <laughs> Life does not have to be easy in order to be full. Now, this one you won't like because I didn't. I'm going to share it with you anyway. It's from C.S. Lewis. If you love deeply, done that? If you love deeply, you will be hurt badly. but it's worth it anyway. Abundant life. The challenges of life, no matter what they are, yours especially, does not cancel out the full life that Jesus gives. It doesn't cancel it. It doesn't replace it. You're not waiting for the abundant life once the challenges in your life have passed over. I must turn to Scripture in order to prove that. So look again with me just briefly here. The Lord is my shepherd again. Psalm 23. And the first thing he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. Now think abundant life. Because if that is true, then the abundant life is the life of contentment, not living for more than I need. He's living the abundant life with the Lord as his shepherd. And he says, I have all I need. Did he say all I want? Hmm. It's when we pursue what we want because we are not content with what we have and need it's then that we step out of the realm of the abundant life. He lets me rest in green meadows. A little different translation. He leads me beside still waters. Oh, now that sounds like the abundant life finally, doesn't it? Isn't that what it all consists of? Is that it? It is that. But it's not just that, because very soon after that, he says, even when I walk through 
the darkest valley in the abundant life. Get the setting. The valley of death, in fact. Losing someone precious to me. I will fear no evil. That's the abundant life. How can he talk like that? Well, it depends who the shepherd is. Because he says, for you, my shepherd, you are close beside me. That's the answer. There's no abundant life without that shepherd close beside us. Cannot have it independently of that. Now, in this abundant life, I'm sorry to tell you, there are some enemies that will try to invade your abundant life. But look what happens. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. So while the enemies are there in the abundant life, they are pretty stunned at the way your shepherd treats you. They're pretty amazed as they watch and see how you focus on the shepherd's goodness rather than on the enemy's badness. Abundant life. That's what it is. And then he says, my cup overflows with blessings. Oh, if that was the only part, the only line that comes after the Lord is my shepherd. No, no, no. It means no matter how tough life gets, your shepherd's gifts outdo everything, or is it outdoes everything? It overflows. In spite of all the horrible stuff, your shepherd makes sure that you have far more than what you even can dream of. So says Paul in Philippians. You see, friends, if you trust your shepherd, you're living the abundant life. No matter how bad things are, that's the abundant life. If you forgive someone who has hurt you, you're living the abundant life. And when you tell the truth, even though that gets you into trouble, you're living the abundant life. And so the list can go on and on and on, stemming from everything we've read about Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. There once was a subway painting. It was an advertisement on the wall big and bold, and as people came by, they couldn't help noticing this huge statement there painted on the wall, and then what it said is, it said, become a loser. Every day, these people walk by, getting on the train, getting off the train, become a loser. I won't tell you what city it is in. But then people took the trouble to go a little closer, and they found that there was some smaller print below that. And here's what they read. If you want to give up the things in this world that keep you from being the best you can be, give us a call. We'll help you lose your life and build a new one. After all, Jesus Christ lost everything, and he gained the entire world. And if you go even closer, there is the tiny, tiny print there, and there's the name of the church and the phone number that you can call to find out how to be a loser and gain everything. After all, isn't it that when you become a loser, in this sense, you're losing your life for Christ's sake? And he said, if you do that, you will save your life. If you lose your life for my sake. Sounds like a pretty good idea to become a loser, isn't it? After all, Jesus lost all to give the full life to those who lose all to gain him. That's the abundant life. Now, I understand. It's hard to explain all this. So I'll try with a little little scenario to clarify And this is about Ed and Cindy. Got married and uh, planned their honeymoon, heading out somewhere, had to fly out from an an airport. But they arrived late. Come to the airport late, you have a high risk of not getting onto the plane. But they were gracious. They let them onto the plane. But unfortunately, they couldn't put them together. They had to be on a separate seat. Now, I don't know how you feel. You just got married. You're going to go on a honeymoon, and you can't sit by your bride. You can't sit by your groom. So here is Ed seated, seated, 
and they put Cindy behind him. And the time came for the flight attendant to walk down the aisle and to check the seat belts and to see if everyone's phones are on airplane, mo airpl airplane mode. And this flight attendant looked into the face of Cindy and saw something different about this woman. No, she wasn't crying. She was beaming. And the flight attendant, having gone through the similar experience herself, she thinks to herself, this lady is happier than anyone else in this plane. So she took the risk and she said to her, ma'am, are you going on your honeymoon? <laughs> yes, said Cindy, how did you know? Well, where's your husband? She pointed, there he is, sitting in front. They couldn't get our seats together. Hmm, said the flight attendant. Turn around, went to the gully, came back a couple of minutes later. And she said, is your name Ed? Yes, follow me. Is your name Cindy? Follow me. She walked them down to the front. You know where. Where did she seat them? First class. And now suddenly, as they are seated, the loudspeakers come on. The flight attendant says, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to introduce you to Ed and Cindy. They're going on their honeymoon. They have been, their seats have been upgraded. Congratulate them and wish them a happy honeymoon. And there the plane erupted, erupted, <laughs> exploded into applause and congratulations. And there was never a greater party. And they sat in these plush leather seats, wide, comfortable, never-ending supply of peanuts, and the service was so great, it must have been South African Airways. <laughs> Made that up. I tell you what, they never got to their destination any quicker, but they got there far better style and far greater comfort because they had been up. Graded. What was God up to when he sent his son down to this earth? He was upgrading life. That's what he was doing. Upgrading life. So imagine, Jesus is your friendly travel agent. And he's inviting you to get on board. If you're not on board yet, he wants you on a flight to heaven as your final destination. And he gives you a ticket and it's free. All you have to do is take it into your heart. You don't take that ticket and just flippantly throw it around. No, it's into your heart. You believe it with all your heart. Now you're on board. And now that you're on board, life begins. The journey goes. And while you're on that journey, your friendly travel agent, who is also your shepherd, wants you to have the upgraded life. The upgraded life, which is the same thing as what Ed and Cindy did when the flight attendant came to them and said to them, follow me. Our travel agent, our shepherd, says, I cannot explain to you, I cannot describe to you, because the experience is out of this world, what abundant life is like. But I can invite you to follow me, and you will discover what that abundant life is. Follow me. And as you follow me, keep your eyes where? on Jesus. Great God, you sent your son not only to die for us, but also to lead us. And today we want to leave this place as followers of Jesus. Not as a slogan, but as a reality that will bring us in conflict with much in this world, but which will keep us connected to our God and our Savior 
And we will be glad in spite of the sad world around us. And we will be triumphant in spite of the battles that go on around us and in us. Right now, Lord, we gladly turn our eyes upon Jesus. And we follow you. Take us into this week and keep us, keep us looking to Jesus, the beautiful, gracious, the great God, so attractive, who is lifted up so that all might be drawn to him. It's in his name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.